Hello AP Calculus AP students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we're going to take a look at our example 4 from our conglomeration of topics from 2.2 to 2.4. We're going to focus on the vertical tangent line in this particular video. So if you remember from the last video we talked about graphs with sharp turns. That's one of the instances where a derivative may not exist but it's not the only instance. So if I scroll down here a little bit to get to the topic of our video today vertical tangent lines, we see a little statement that says the definition of a tangent line to a curve does not cover the possibility of a vertical tangent line. For vertical tangent lines, it's kind of possible to alter that approach a little bit, and we have a completely different definition as you can see in the box below. And it's possible that this box might contain some information that's a little bit hard to interpret. You have a couple of limit statements as h approaches zero, and we're given uh, an f of c plus h minus f of c over h. That would be our difference of y's over difference of x's, I suppose. But see, because h is approaching 0, we've been able to trick the slope into thinking that it's not the slope of a line that joins two points, but a slope of a line that joins one point. Long story short, the answers to these two limits are either going to be infinity or negative infinity. And really the best way that I can demonstrate that is by looking at the picture that we have over here to the right. Let's say that I have a situation where I have a point on here and, and that point has a certain distance away from C. Now remember, as, as H approaches zero, that basically means that the distance between that point and that X value C is going to narrow. It's going to get smaller. So if I start this process of trying to find the slope of the tangent line, I certainly have some kind of a slope right there. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's some positive number. If I keep moving closer to the value of C, but yet stay on the curve, my slope might become that slope, which is a bit steeper. Let's go one more here, closer still, and I have a pretty darn steep slope there with that green line. So hopefully you can see that that slope is going to gradually approach infinity because the line is going to approach being in a completely vertical position. Without having to draw it in, the right side is going to do pretty much the same thing. As I move from the right towards the left, I will put myself into a position where I have a very steep slope. Now, take note, the same thing could happen with a slope that's going to be negative infinity just as easily. In that situation, I may have a graph that looks a little bit something, uh, maybe it looks something like this, and hopefully that is easy to see that your slopes, as you're kind of moving through, tend to become negative infinity in size. Okay? So, how do we manifest this with a specific example? Well, we have in our example four uh, to sketch the graph and find the derivative of a very unique function, f of x equal x to the one-third. Maybe it's something that we don't graph a whole lot. And we want to do so when x is 0. Now, I have gone ahead and copied and pasted the definition of derivative at a point in your notes. This is the same definition that you started this whole unit with, right within your unit uh, 2 uh, topic 1, uh, first page of your notes. We introduced this to you because we're going to use this again because anytime that you're finding this derivative using the limit definition at a specific point, this is your go-to formula. So what do we have here? Well, first of all, we see that f prime of c, and our c in this case is going to be 0, is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches that c, which is 0, of the function f of x on top, and our function f of x is simply the function x to the one-third, minus f of c, well off to the side we might think about, well, what is f of 0? Remember, our c is 0. Well, that would be 0 to the 1 third power, which, of course, is going to be 0. So it doesn't seem like I'm doing a whole heck of a lot there, but I'll go ahead and 
subtract the zero nonetheless, and then the denominator is going to be x minus zero. So that's what I have for my limit. So what do you say we simplify this a little bit? Well, if we do that, we see that x to the one-third divided by x to the first, uh, that doesn't produce something very nice. If you subtract your exponents, one-third minus one, you would get negative two-thirds. Because that exponent is negative, we're going to allow that term to reside in the denominator with a positive exponent, and so we would have 1 over x to the 2 thirds. Now, as you can see, as this x gets very small, we end up having a very, very small denominator, because if you end up taking a small number and take the cube root of it, it's just going to get smaller still. And even if you square a small number, it actually still gets smaller, right? If you take a, a number that's less than one between zero and one and you square it, multiply it by itself, it actually gets smaller. So this is going to definitely become something like infinity. One over very, very small is infinity. Now it wanted us to go ahead and um, take a look at the graph and I also want to make sure that I revisit this because I want to say, well, what, what does this answer truly mean? So let's go ahead and take a look at a graph of x to the one-third. So here we are with our graphing software. I'm going to input the function x raised to, and let's go ahead and use a nice fraction exponent, one-third power. And this is what we see. And a few things that we might notice. There are some fairly nice ordered pairs like 0, 0, and 1, 1, and even negative 1, negative 1. But we're going to be pretty hard pressed to find another nice ordered pair unless we go all the way out to say 8, and maybe 2 as the y value because we know the cube root of 8 is equal to 2 if you start to think about that. So this is what the graph is going to look like. So I'm going to transport that over into our notes document. So back in our notes, we're going to go ahead and plot that curve. We knew that 0, 0 lies on it, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. Now this is where we have a bit of a problem because I can't really fit that 8, 2 in here. But I do know that the graph is going to do something like this. And then it's also, mm, I might want to draw that just a little bit better. It's kind of a tricky one to draw, you guys. It's going to look a little something, I think, like that. And it's very, very subtle. But at this point when x is 0, you would have a vertical tangent line. Sometimes I find myself having to redraw these over and over again to really emphasize that idea that we're going to be vertical right there. All right, I'm never going to grade you on your artistic ability if you are able to depict that particular location. I'm more concerned with understanding that this is going to be an undefined derivative, and that's exactly what the answer to this is going to be, because it says that if we have our limits that equal infinity, then we have this vertical tangent line that passes through that point C, or in this problem, that point where uh, x is 0 that point c comma f of c. So really when it gets down to this, if you have a derivative that does give you an infinity, you could say that this derivative does not exist. You know, sometimes I'll even allow a student to say that the derivative is not defined, right? We have this infinity number, or uh, should say this infinity value, which isn't a number, and that's the reason why we can't say that it exists. So, so far, to recap, you have two different situations where a derivative may fail to exist. Sharp turns and vertical tangent lines. Now, if you flip the page in your notes, there's a bit of a, of a recap with those ideas here. And let me move the camera view out of the way here. It says the derivative of a function f of x at a point where f of x has a sharp turn or a cusp does not exist. The derivative of function f of x at a point where f of x has a vertical tangent line doesn't exist. So for this activity, they wanted you to sketch a graph of two different functions where the derivative of f of x at some c fails to exist because of each reason shown to the left. It would be a great time if you wanted to pause the video, try to sketch those two reasons, see if your 
results match my results, and then we can talk about it. All right, welcome back. So for the first reason, if you want to draw any kind of a sharp turn, all I need to see is something that looks like you've got nice, smooth kind of uh, motion to it. And then all of a sudden, when you get to the C, you can just draw something that's a little bit of abrupt of a change. It doesn't have to be a super sharp turn, like a V shape, which we've seen many times. It can be something as subtle as that, and the derivative won't exist. You'll see some proof of that later on. Now, for reason two, you want to draw it so that there is a vertical tangent line. So if you draw something, um, trying to think of something that we haven't quite seen before, but we've really seen the two different versions of a vertical tangent line. Maybe we have a graph that's increasing, and then all of a sudden it gets to here, and then whoosh, it continues to increase. But right there at that point, we're going to be vertical with our tangent. All right. Theorem below here will become very important throughout the course by allowing you to apply it to special theorems. The differentiability implies continuity. It's one of our easiest theorems. It's just one that we're going to have to tuck away and remember and bring out when the time comes. But it simply says if you have a function that you know is differentiable at C, it means that that function has to be continuous. It's pretty hard to draw a slope of a tangent line to a point if you don't have a point there already. And that's what this is saying. If you can take the derivative, then you know that the function's continuous. Pretty easy. Now, the last thing I wanted to do here is this think about it. True or false, the converse to that theorem above is also true. And if you have forgotten what a converse is, it's just flipping the if and then. I want you to take a second to think about that. I'd like you to even pause the video so that you can collect your thoughts. Tell me, what do you think, true or false? The answer is false, which if you read a little further, it says, hmm, if the converse is not true, sketch a function to the right that serves as a counterexample. <laughs> so you probably thought that, OK, this has got to be false. So basically, they want you draw something that's continuous. So if a function's continuous, does it mean it has to be differentiable? In other words, does continuity imply, this is a way that we can write the word imply, differentiability? Well, if we try to draw some kind of a continuous function, we notice that you could draw something that's continuous and then all of a sudden you get to C and then you could do a variety of things. Maybe you do this, you have a sharp turn. So yes, this thing is continuous that I just sketched, but it's certainly not going to be differentiable at that sharp turn. So just because you're continuous doesn't imply differentiability. So that is not a true statement. And that's why that converse is false. Anyhow, I hope this helps a little bit. And the final video for this particular uh, topic, we're going to work through four examples in one video. They're all pretty quick that will kind of pull some of the ideas together and talk about some of the things that you have seen previous to this uh, particular lesson and tie those in as well. Anyway, thanks for joining and we'll see you at the next video.